So here's a, a wind-driven case, the first one that I was involved with where flow path became a big issue. Uh, Vandalia Avenue in New York City. When you look at the apartment building on the downwind side and on the upwind side, and uh, you see that there's soot stains that are pretty similar. And so one of the questions was, geez, you know, which of the, from outside, which one is the fire apartment? Well, the fire apartment was on the upwind side. And a little old lady lived there. She'd just gotten new carpeting. She was going to have a, a party, a little get-together, wine and cheese party with some of her neighbors. This was a senior living facility. Um, and so she had her, the fact that the new carpet kept her front door open wasn't a big issue for her. It was actually going to work out for her that night. You know, this, the self-door closers weren't going to get the door closed tonight because the new high pile on her new carpet. And so the door was open. And around 11.30 or so in the evening, one of her neighbors noticed that she was relaxing on a sofa in front of these windows having a cigarette. About 4.30 in the morning, the fire alarms in the building go off. And uh, the fire department arrives, and uh, Lieutenant Cavalieri, Firefighter Bohan, and Firefighter Bop uh, come in from the elevator lobby and start making their way down the hallway. They were accompanied by a, a captain from an engine company, he left them at that point. They looked down the hall, a little bit of smoke, not too bad. You know, let's go see what we need to do. There's a lady in the apartment next to the fire apartment, and uh, she calls 911. She's in a wheelchair, and she needs to be rescued. And so a crew comes up the stairs here, and they bring her out, and uh, she's treated for smoke inhalation and released that day. Uh, there's a little old guy in this apartment down here. Now, he's getting some smoke in his apartment, and he doesn't like that. So apparently when he's had smoke in his apartment before from cooking or whatnot, what he did to get rid of it was open the windows. Well, now, this is the upwind side, high pressure, and this is the downwind side, low pressure. Right? So just like hot goes to cold, high pressure always goes to low pressure. So when he opens that window, he creates a flow path. Right? And so that flow path is now coming from the uh, fire apartment, down the hall and out his apartment. So he's getting more smoke in his apartment. So he decides he's going to leave. So he opens his apartment door. He gets even more smoke. He doesn't like that. He leaves his apartment door open and he goes into his bedroom and he safely rides out the fire. So now Firefighter Bohan, Firefighter Bop, and Lieutenant Cavalieri are between where the fire is and where the fire wants to go. They're in this area here. When the window fails on this fire apartment, that Heat release rate of the fire increases due to the increased level of oxygen. The fire comes out in the hall, and due to the pressure from the wind, the fire gets driven out into the hall, and as a result, uh, Lieutenant Cavalieri, Firefighter Bohan, Firefighter Bop die. Um, Firefighter Bop got a mayday off uh, very quickly. Firefighters here now open this door again, and as was the practice in New York City at the time, they would send their roof man up, and he would open the bulkhead door, and keep it open for the duration of the fire. The roof man in this case was going back and forth telling him, high wind condition, I see flame pushing in and out of the window of the fire apartment. But that because the bulkhead door is open and when this door gets open now, that's part of the flow path as well. So they, the first hose crew gets burned, they can't advance the line. Eventually they advance a uh, inch and three quarter line and a two and a half inch line down the hall and uh, unfortunately not in time uh, to save the other members. So this is what the hallway looked like between the fire apartment doorway and the attack stair doorway. This is looking from the front door of the apartment into the apartment. So you see that the apartment, although it wasn't heavily furnished, it had a, a sofa or two in it and um, a, uh, basically a wood dining room set, again lightly uh, upholstered. It had burned long enough it got back into the wall and, and picked up some foam insulation that was burning on the outside wall as well. It burned hot enough that it spalled the ceiling planks uh, that formed the ceiling of this apartment. So a lot of energy was released. So before our fire dynamic simulator even had its name, we ran a model with it. Uh, the blue box represents the wind, and uh, the fire apartment is uh, right in front of the blue box there. And this is the little old man's apartment. And then, we, of course, we have the stairwell on the opposite side. So what you'll see is when the window breaks, the fire size is going to increase and smoke is going to start to move down the hall. And 
because the roof man said that the flames were pulsing in and out of the window, I assumed that the wind was fluctuating. So when I modeled it, I had the wind go up to 20 miles an hour and then back down to zero. So every time you see a wind pulse in the model, flames and heat will move down the hall. In response to the May Day, now the door to the stairwell is going to open, and then you'll see smoke and flames move into the stairwell as well, uh, to basically heading toward the bulkhead doorway. So plenty of fuel there. The flame, it could split, even though it appeared vented from the street, there was still plenty of fire and energy um, that put these firefighters in jeopardy. So 10 years later, we get an, an opportunity to run a project to really study this wind-driven fire phenomenon. And as I described a little bit earlier in the class, uh, we have this flow path where basically we have the, the, the bedroom, we have a hallway, we've got a target room here, there's a hollow core door between the, the target room and this hallway, and then the living room and our outlets, non-flow side and flow side. So I'm going to go through this again quickly, reminding you that you only need one piece of furniture to flash over, to have enough energy to flash over a typical residential scale room. And we'll watch this video again. So again, our fire starts here in the bedroom. We have our, our hot, our plume starting to impinge on the ceiling. Ceiling jet moves across the ceiling. Once it hits the walls and forms the hot gas layer, it starts to build up in depth and then spread down the hallway and into the living room. And notice that when it starts to flow out the doorway into this corridor, it's going to head for this vent, right? The flow is very directional away from the camera toward the vent, part of the flow path. Right now, if you were to get there right now and start to make an attack and work your way down the hall to get to the fire bedroom, this is sort of that old school, early growth stage you're there in time. It hasn't gone into a decay stage yet. But now, that's transitioning to a decay stage. And as soon as this window, which might fail accidentally or might be ventilated in a, in a, uh, as a ventilation tactic, Look at what it does in that hallway, right? It's no longer a hot gas layer, cold layer environment. Now any firefighter that would be in that hallway is in that hot convective flow. Heat transfer to that firefighter increases dramatically. We're going to watch the hollow core door fail. Interestingly enough, until that door fails, somebody would have a chance of surviving behind that door, right? So, I mean, from a, a victim's perspective, Having a closed door doing whatever compartmentation you can is a big value. Notice how that flame is pulsing in and out. Now this is with no wind. So again, very dramatic increase in heat release rate. Uh, it goes from about 2 megawatts to 13 to 14 megawatts within 60 seconds. The bedroom temperatures. Initially, we had over 1,000 degrees at the ceiling and about 500 degrees at the floor. Uh, once the windows vented, now floor to ceiling, we're post-flashover. We have a very well-mixed fire going from floor to ceiling in excess of 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit, and it stays that way until suppression. The living room temperatures. So what's happening in the living room is there's not really a lot of fire in the living room. Why not? There's temperatures at the ceiling that are about 700 degrees. They're pretty warm. So what's going on is the temperatures and the heat flux in the living room are hot enough to start to pyrolyze the furniture and the carpeting that are in the living room. So gaseous fuel is being created, but it doesn't have any oxygen down there to burn. Then when we vent the window, it starts to pick up some oxygen, but it's still burning pretty inefficiently because you see, we're not post flashover yet. We still have a temperature gradient. Although now the ceiling temperatures are about 1400 degrees Fahrenheit, and near one foot above the floor, it's about 800 degrees Fahrenheit. When that door fails to the target room, the chunk of oxygen that's, that's stuck in that target room gets pulled out into the hall, and that's what causes this increase in temperature here, and then we sort of transition to our, our flashover state. The velocity in the hallway. High pressure wants to go to low pressure. So initially, with that window in place, we don't have this big exchange between high pressure and low pressure, and we just have the ceiling jet that's going across the ceiling at about nine miles an hour or so. Once the window's gone, we have this well-mixed fire environment, high pressure in the, in the bedroom, forcing its way to the low pressure in the living room, 
So the conditions in the hallway floor to ceiling are now somewhere between, say, 8 miles an hour and 12 miles an hour. Right? So this is that H factor in that convection heat transfer equation that's increasing the heat transfer to any target that's in that hallway. Living room, gas concentrations at 6 feet. This is oxygen. The red line is oxygen. The yellow line is uh, carbon dioxide. The uh, sort of triangles here, this green line is carbon monoxide or CO. And then this purple line are the total uh, unburned hydrocarbons. This is the excess fuel that's still in the living room to burn. So you can see the oxygen concentration went way down. Um, CO2 way up, CO way up. So the CO is sitting at about 6%. That's 60,000 parts per million. So when you get to about 3% CO, that's one breath that will drop a person in their tracks, an unprotected person. What about at two feet above the floor in the living room? Well, we still don't have a lot of oxygen down there. Our uh, CO2 is above 15%, and our CO is in excess, again, of sitting around 6%. So very unhealthy environment for all involved. Total unburned hydrocarbons in the, in the uh, living room, we've got about 12%. So again, there's more, if it just had more oxygen, it could burn those unburned hydrocarbons, right? The heat is there, the fuel is there, it just needs more oxygen to burn. So if you vertically vented that room, what would happen? It would burn hotter, the heat release rate would increase. If you broke a win an additional window on that room, the heat release rate would increase because it's got excess fuel to burn and it's already preheated, ready to go. Now we're going to add some wind. So in this case, I'm letting you look at the inlet, which is the window, and the outlet, which is the door from the fire apartment to the corridor. I've got a 20 mile an hour wind, steady wind, hitting the side of that building. Notice that in the corridor, we have a nice two layer environment, which are good working conditions for a firefighter. Look what happened when the window broke. Look at how rapidly that changed. This is playing in real time. What do you notice about the flames at the window, even though I have a steady 20 mile an hour wind? They're pulsing in and out, just like the roof man from Vandalia said. The key thing is we didn't understand it at that point in time. The pressure is so high in that apartment, it can't force it all out through the exit. So in, a, in effect, it's burping itself to relieve the pressure and then sucking back in the window. Here's another case. In this case, the apartment door is closed. Right? So you'll notice that with the apartment door closed, this is having a hard time even failing the window right? because the pressure is bottled up in that fire apartment. So now we break the window. It's still burning very inefficiently. It's having trouble breathing. And the apartment door you know, is providing protection. It's cutting off the flow path. You can see the leakage, and there's a lot of energy on the other side of that door. You can see that with the thermal imager. Now the key thing here is, this might be the sort of situation where you'd get your crew, you'd have your line, you'd have your line charged, and you say, okay, we're going to get low, we're going to pop the door, and we're going to go in. And that would really be a disaster because you see the kind of thermal assault you're going to take right in front of that door. And flowing a line, unless you can get the fire gases where they're originating back here, you're not going to have a lot of impact on that. You'd be much better off introducing water from this side, either with a high-rise nozzle or a wind control device to cover it, to cut the flow path, things that New York is, is working on. Uh, impact of the door. Again, this, this line is where we open the door times zero. And uh, the red line is three feet above the floor in the bedroom. The yellow line is three feet above the floor in the living room. And the other lines are out in the corridor, the purple one being in the flow path and the other two being on the non-flow path side. So what you notice very rapidly, uh, as we talked about before, the fuel is hot enough to be pyrolyzing in the living room. Once that window's open, the temperature in the bedroom cools off initially and then increases to over 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit in a space of less than 10 seconds. The, um, the living room also follows suit, and then the flow path in the hallway is above 1,000 degrees. All this is occurring within 20 seconds of opening that door. So again, what the wind is basically doing in this case, it's still doing what would happen normally, except it's accelerating the whole process. It's crunching down that timeline. As Steve had said earlier, with the, the such a fuel-rich environment, it's less forgiving 
than the older fuels that, that gave you a little more time, gave you a little more options with regard to ventilation and things of that nature. I'm going to show you one last experiment here from this series of, of tests. And what we're going to do, same as before, we're going to let the fire develop, except this time we're going to put our laboratory at risk for the interest of science. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to let the fire uh, come, out of, come out of the vertical vent and basically the smoke is going to build up in our 30 foot by 40 foot hood and auto ignite and burn. And then we're going to introduce a hose stream into this window. Here's the video view here in the upper left hand corner and the lower right hand corner is the uh, IR view. We're going to introduce a hose stream in there once we have the hood on fire and uh, look at the impact. So the hose stream's flowing about 80 gallons a minute and uh, we have about 40 feet of apartment between where they're introducing the hose stream and the fire in the stack. So we're going to watch it develop. Everything's darkened down inside the apartment itself. We see some flames coming up into the stack. And now we're going to ignite the gases that are residing in that stack before they can get sucked up our six foot diameter hood. The fireman's getting ready to introduce some water at the window. There it goes. What happened to the fire in the hood? Gone, right within seconds. Now you look at the video view of the room and you say, wait a minute, there's still a lot of fire in that room. Well, there is, but really you'll see as we, the bedroom view starts to improve for us is that what we have now are a lot of incipient fires. We've got the remains of a couple of chairs in front of the window that are burning. We've got the remains of the bed that are burning. A dresser is burning. But what you've taken out of the equation is this reservoir of hot gases that was burning from one end of the apartment all the way out into our hood, right? That's been neutralized. That's been taken away just by this hose stream. And you see the view is cleared up in the bedroom view, and then he stands up and, and knocks the rest of the fire down. So again, taking those fire gases out of play and bringing it back to the fact that you might have just a sofa burning or a, a chair burning or something like that, that's something you can go inside and deal with. So then we moved into a high rise. And uh, we went to Governor's Island in New York, and we went there in February because it's cold and windy. So the weatherman says, and history says, about 90% of the time. The whole time we're pulling wires, putting up our instrumentation, loading furniture into the building, very windy, very cold. Then we got a snowstorm, still remained cold, but the wind stopped. So we, we brought our own wind, and uh, we, we had the good fortune to have some uh, squad guys tie this, take this fan off the back of the manufacturer's pickup truck and uh, lash it to this boom lift and we put it up 60, 70 feet in the air. Um, so we had our good wind. Again, we're using real fuels and then we start demonstrating things. So again, now we're working with the fire service. How would you attack this fire? Well, we're going to go in, we're going to open the lobby doors, chock them open. We're going to get to the stairwell, attack stair, we're going to chock it open. We're going to go upstairs, we're going to open the bulkhead or we're going to you know, get, get our attack crew set for the stair and then we start changing it to see how we could make it better. In this case, this graph is just showing you temperatures in the corridor between the fire apartment, which has an open door and wind blowing in the fire apartment, and uh, the bulk and the stairwell door. So this is stairwell seven, the door is closed. The bedroom window is failing, so now we're gonna have the wind having an impact. They open the stairwell door a little bit and you see the temperature in the hallway increase as they start to complete that flow path. Then they open the stairwell the rest of the way and we open the bulkhead and that provides our exit. We open the damper on the end of the exhaust in the wood, in the wood stove and you see how rapidly the temperatures in the hallway outside the apartment increase from something that might be tenable for a firefighter to work in for a short time to something that's completely untenable for a firefighter in full protective clothing. And you see the time it happens. Each one of these marks down here is 10 seconds. So it's happening in the, in the space of less than 20 seconds. Very rapid transition. This isn't just a high rise issue. Single family homes. Uh, here's an incident that happened in Houston. Uh, killed a captain, very experienced captain, more than 25 years on the job, as well as a young firefighter who was 30 days on the job and this was their first fire. Uh, the wind was coming from the rear of the structure and uh, there was so much smoke in the street uh, in front of the house and when the fire department arrived, fire sort of happened in the middle of the night, the, the uh, engineer stopped 
because he didn't want to hit any parked cars. He wanted to get a better view of where he was going. And then he took the apparatus down the street past the house. They hooked up to a hydrant and uh, the lines start going in the front door on the low wind side. Now this was a very difficult house to gain access to to the rear. Again, uh, some confusion about whether people were in the house or not. In fact, the occupants were out of the house and they had opened the garage door to the house to get their cars out. So again, another opening on the downwind side. So here's the front door. Um, the nozzle uh, from the victims was found here. Their line went down the hallway. Their nozzle was found here. And uh, the two firefighters' bodies were found in this location here, so they were well off their line. Uh, another um, engine company was in here. They were flowing water in this area here. Uh, they were hooking the ceiling, and as they were getting basically chased out of the fire by high heat conditions, uh, they noticed that they could see these guys' boots back here, that they were still standing at that point in time. The big change in this case was, again, failure of glass. Uh, there was a glass patio back here, and uh, when it failed, that, cha that changed the flow path, right? That was our inlet, and the exhaust became through the downwind side. The fire had started in the attic. This was an older house. It had been added on too many times. In some cases, it actually had a double roof, so there were asphalt shingles actually in the attic providing additional fuel, uh, and you can see how it burned away there. A ladder company was on the roof. And uh, they made some cuts right in this area here. Uh, the ladder captain says as soon as they, they made their first cut, fire came out of it. They kept cutting and did a good job and, and opened, up, opened up the space. And he said he looked to the rear of the house. And he noticed that there was a flame overlapping the eaves that was about one or two feet wide. As soon as they were done with their cut and punching down the ceiling, he looked back again. And now he saw that that flame overlapping the eaves was about 20 feet wide. Well, that's because all that glass, solarium glass, had failed. So again, we're modeling this fire to try to get some understanding of what the flow path looked like and what happened. In our models, we include uh, the roof vents. We try to get the whole timeline down uh, for when they're pulling the ceiling and, and that sort of thing. And uh, this is what it looks like. So the graphic on the side, anything that's red or above is 500 degrees Fahrenheit or above. So not healthy for a firefighter. Our slice line here is about three feet above the floor. Here's our garage door that's open. The door between the kitchen and the garage was also left open by the occupants. And then this is the door the firefighters are going to open to make entry. The wind is coming from this direction. So the front door is open. They open the door, and then what do you do? Well, you've got to get your mask on, get your helmet on, whatnot. Again, this is an issue. When are you making the vent? Right? You don't want to vent until you're ready to take some action. Or if you're going to open the door and take a look and you see conditions aren't so good, close the door again. Right? Don't allow the fire time to build up by entraining more air. So things are heating up. In fact, opening the door, they make their, you're going to see when they make the roof cuts right in the, uh, the foyer area, it'll cool off a little bit. They'll get a little bit of lift. So now the roof is vented. It cools off a little bit in this area. Things are working and then the glass fails and now you see where the heat's going so they couldn't stay on their line and follow their line out probably if they wanted to they went to an area that was not as hot it just wasn't cool enough for them to survive so this is a side view looking at the front entry so the view on the left is before the wind is impacting it so you see it's cooler close to the floor you could crawl in and under there once the wind is blowing through the house it's dropping the heat, it's mixing it toward the floor. You can't get low enough to get out of the thermal flow. And perhaps more importantly is the velocity of that hot gas. Before the window breaks, three feet above the floor or so, fresh air is being entrained inside that front door, bringing cool air into the house, also feeding the fire. But if you're in the location of the doorway, as a firefighter, it's going to help you. It's going to help keep you cool. Once the glass breaks, notice what happens the flow reverses and hot gases are coming out at that same location. Again, no escape. So wind. Keep the wind at your back, stay upwind. Otherwise, you're literally putting your crew at the mercy of whether this glass that's less than a quarter inch thick or not is going to break while they're in there. 
or whether somebody from another company in an uncoordinated manner makes a vent and, and puts them in harm's way, puts them in the flow path. Again, just a top-down view. This is the direction of the wind out to the front door and out through the garage. So they couldn't go this way. They couldn't go this way. There were security bars on the windows here. They got to the best place they could and couldn't get any further. Again, you'll see where the flow path is because that's where the most of the burn damage will be because that's where the oxygen's mixing with the fire. So it brings us to some questions about ventilation. Can you really vent enough? So here was an incident that occurred in uh, New York City. Uh, Rob Weedman uh, was burned in this incident, as was um, Firefighter Gersbeck. And the fire started upstairs in the rear. Uh, the fire marshals from New York City said that uh, it was a, uh, a, hair, a uh, hair roller, um, curling iron that was left in a pile of clothes, started on fire. Uh, mom had taken her children to school. She was gone on the order of 45 minutes. She comes back to her house. She hears the smoke. She's outside. She hears the smoke alarm going off from the outside. She makes entry in the front door, goes upstairs a little bit, sees smoke upstairs, and calls the fire department. Now, again, some confusion. Where is she when she uses her cell phone and calls the fire department? She's in the structure. So the call goes out that someone's in the house. You know, you hear that, uh, that sort of sets the tone. So what happens is the firefighters arrive and they do meet the, the resident outside. They go in to do a, uh, a primary search. Ladder company gets on the roof and starts taking out skylights. So skylights are pretty easy to make a lot of ventilation pretty quick. And uh, unbeknownst to the firefighters initially, the fire had vented the two windows out the rear already. So now we're picking up fresh air from the, the front stair and uh, the fire's venting out the rear. As the firefighters are doing their search in this room, they're getting hot and the thought was we're gonna vent to cool. So they start breaking windows. And once they break the first window and then the second window's broken, um, basically they flash over that room. Gersbeck goes back into the structure. He's on fire. They have the line at the top of the stairs at that point. They hit him with water, cool him off, and he's basically treated and released that day. Firefighter Widman, who's seen here in the image, is coming out the window. Um, and fortunately, uh, the chauffeur was very quick to move the ladder to, to get him off. He comes outside on fire. Again, they hit him with a hose line to cool him off, and uh, he was extremely burned, um, but fortunately, he's alive. So basically what happens with the timeline here is that within the space of about a minute, they get over 40 feet, 40 square feet of vertical ventilation. Now, how many of you can do that with your saws, right? I mean, that's a lot of vertical ventilation. So if vertical ventilation were ever going to outrun the pace of the fire, I would think this would be the case. The problem is there's a lot of fuel in this row house. And the reason is the fire started back here. This is what they refer to as a railroad flat. These four rooms coming from the rear bedroom to two middle bedrooms to the front bedroom are basically connected with hardly any compartmentation. There are two wood frame glass doors between this room and this room. There's a hollow core door between this room and this room. And um, there's no doorway between this room and this room. The one skylight sits between these rooms. There's another skylight over the top of the stairs. There's a scuttle opening here, and there's another skylight over the bathroom. So all those skylights and scuttles were opened up pretty quickly. You can see that in the rear room, the fire had been burning for some time. It failed the gypsum board ceiling. It got up into the cockloft space, and it had heavily charred uh, the wood joists that were supporting the roof. Again, the worst place to have fuel is in a place where it can't really burn very well. It just pyrolyzes and creates a tremendous amount of unburned fuel. So fuel at the ceiling, the hot gas layer is there, the hot gas layer is uh, oxygen depleted already, and um, that's creating a lot of fuel to move elsewhere. Here's the front room where the firefighters sustained their injuries. Again, it went to a post flashover condition, but as you can tell from the lab, still being in place, not for a very long time. This is the stair uh, where the line was brought up. And uh, this window, again, you see we had bi-directional flow in the window, hot gases out top, cool gases going in, which uh, aided in, uh, in Rob Weedman surviving. 
uh, that the, the fresh air was coming in to cool him off. Uh, what, what little benefit that was, it was still some benefit. It kept, helped, he got his face out the window, so his face piece remained pretty much intact with just uh, uh, some small damage to it. So again, we put in, in our model, we developed the timeline. Again, we're following from what we have from the fire ground radio and the radio traffic. So basically, before ventilation, we've got the fire here in the rear upstairs. After ventilation, you see that the smoke layer in the stairwell went up, but now we have flames at the ceiling, and we also have flames through all the bedrooms here as well. Showed that to the uh, senior staff at FDNY. They asked us to run a number of cases where we would perhaps control the door, close the front door, or not take windows, or leave some of the vents in place. Anything we did to limit ventilation resulted in lower temperatures and less heat release rate slowed down the whole process.